This December 1st, 2016 regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence, and the performance of the National Anthem by the Luther Jackson Middle School Concert Choir under the direction of Patricia Little. Thank you so much, Luther Jackson Choir. That was wonderful right here on your own home turf. And thank you so much for hosting us every other, every other Thursday. Thank you. Oh, and uh, I believe the principal, Chad Lehman, is here. Is that right? Could you say, oh, thank you so much. Good job, Mr. Lehman. Now going to certify the closed meeting that we had in order to comply with section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia. It's necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on December 1, 2016, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Do I have a motion? Moved by uh, Mrs. Schultz, seconded by Mr. Moon. All those in favor? Um, is that, that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, with uh, Ms. Derenak Kofax away from the table. And uh, Ms. Hines. Uh, just uh, as an announcement, our forum for tonight is um, canceled um, and we will um, set the uh, forum topic for our, our next meeting. A few announcements before we begin tonight's meeting. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda and any agenda item that's being discussed tonight, that information is on the table at the auditorium entrance. Tonight's agenda is available by going to school board on the FCPS homepage and selecting board docs under upcoming school board meetings. The meeting is also being streamed live online. Select school board uh, from full menu, then click on the watch live button on the school board meetings webpage. Please turn off or silence your cell phone. I call on Ms. Chu for announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. In honor of Disability History Awareness Month in October, students with disabilities have developed a resource called the Guidebook to Planning and Inclusion Project to help co school communities raise awareness of disabilities and the importance of building inclusive school communities. 
The guidebook was created by students with the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities Youth Leadership Forum in collaboration with the Virginia Department of Education's I'm Determined project. The guidebook includes sample activities and resources for use by all grade levels to promote disability awareness and inclusiveness. It also provides resources and templates schools can use to plan and carry out their own inclusion project events. The sample activities in the guide were successfully piloted during the 2015 to 2016 school year by schools in Northumberland County and Radford. The guide to planning and inclusion project is now available on the Virginia Department of Education website at doe.virginia.gov. That is all, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chu. Item 2.04, student recognition. I call on Mrs. Strauss for the recognition. Thank you, well, this is really very exciting. Uh, tonight we recognize the winner of the 2016 U.S. Bands Virginia State Championship. The McLean High School Highlander Marching Band represented here this evening by their chamber ensemble and I believe they are going to play first. As they are coming in, let me read what we are recognizing them for. On October 29th, 2016, the McLean Highlander Marching Band brought home the Grand Champion Award with the highest score of the day at the U.S. Band's Virginia State Championship in Virginia Beach for their show titled Story of My Life. Not only did they win the Grand Champion Award, but they also won Best Color Guard, Best Music, Best Overall Effect, Best Percussion, and Best Visual. They cleaned up. Story of My Life is an uplifting performance about what's most important in our lives, love, and includes beautifully played tunes, smartly woven with exciting formations by the 160-person marching band and color guard who dance, jump, and are hoisted into the air. In the end, they all fall into a perfect heart. The award-winning McLean Highlander marching band is under the direction of Chris Weiss and Deirdre Denson, and I believe they will perform for us right now. Thank you.
Thank you. That was beautiful. If you would all like to now come down the stairs and we will have the picture in front of the big. No, it's okay. It'll come down. And the school board will do the scrunch. I think we saw uh, Principal Ellen Riley here of McLean High School. If you'd like to join us for the picture, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, that was certainly a special treat. And for the record, that was our very first student recognition under a new program that we have. So our very first recognition and performance. So thank you. Um, another announcement, uh, Ms. Darnett Koufax and Ms. Hines uh, will not be able to make tonight's meeting. We now move to uh, item 3.01, citizen participation. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Thank you for your cooperation and thanks to those who have come out to speak to us tonight. Tonight we have uh, 10 citizens signed up to address the board. And the first is Lindsay McCulley with students from Glasgow Middle School. Ms. McCulley. Welcome to um, our Glasgow students. Thank you. You can get in that order. All right, well, good evening, school board members, and thank you for having us. My name is Lindsay Mulcahy. This is my fifth year teaching at Glasgow, mm -hmm. and we've been working very hard the past few years to develop our on-time graduation program, and we were excited this year to start a new elective we call Success Prep. And it is helping students develop the skills they'll need to be successful in middle school, high school, and beyond. So we have some seventh grade success prep students here who are very motivated and wanted to talk to you about uh, middle school start times for the 2017-2018 uh, school year because they feel that's something that's been impacting them lately. So I will not talk any further and I'll let them share their testimonies with you that they hope to uh, will shed some light on how start times impact them. Hi, my name is Enrique Gonzalez. Um, yesterday, 
I woke up late and almost missed the bus. So because of that, I got um, tardy to school and get in trouble. But for me to be successful, I need more sleep. Hi, my name is Lizzie Salguero. My alarm rings at 6, but I wake up at 6.30 and never have time to eat breakfast in the morning. Sometimes it's difficult to focus in class because I fall asleep and don't remember the lesson. I need more sleep in order to get better grades in school. Thank you. Hi, my name is Estevali. I wake up at 6.30 and my bus passes by 6.50. I don't have time to eat or change. I get in trouble because I can't focus. I need more sleep so I can get better grades. Hello, my name is Austin Diaz. One morning I woke up late and I almost missed the bus. And there was a test that day and I did not get the grade I wanted because I did not get enough sleep. I need a later start time to get good grades in school. Thank you. Hi, my name is Renera Money. And one day I missed the bus because <clears throat> it was hard to get up at school that day. It was hard to concentrate because it, I was tired. My teacher kept warning me if, my teacher kept warning me she would call my mom if I didn't get up. I need more sleep so I can succeed. Hi, my name is Jessica and I'll be sharing my opinions and thoughts on why they should change school start time. So I wake up at 6.30 a.m. and my bus arrives at 6.55. The problem with this is that I rush to catch the bus and I don't eat breakfast and missing and I miss the bus. And when I miss the bus, I miss an important lesson or a, cl or a class. A later start time would be, would improve better grades and better understanding in class. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sahil. One morning I woke up in a bad mood. My mom said there is not enough time for breakfast and your bus is coming. When I went outside, I missed my bus, which made my dad have to wake up and drop me off. That day, I couldn't learn anything because I was tired. I want a later start time in 2017 and 2018 year. Go ahead. You, you, can, you can finish. My name is Brittany Nogales, and on Monday, I woke up late, and I only had six minutes to get ready, so I rushed, and when I got on the bus, I was so tired. Then when I got to school, I was sleepy and hungry because I didn't have time to eat breakfast in the morning and I couldn't focus and pay attention in class. I want more sleep and I need later start time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you joining us tonight. Next on our agenda is uh, Bethany Kozma to be followed by Laura Miller John and John Koshka. Ms. Uh, Kozma? Welcome. Thank you. I'm here tonight to read remarks from a Fairfax County uh, resident and mother of young children who unfortunately is unable to address the school board in person. What follows are her remarks. Thank you, school board members, for the opportunity to address the agenda topic legislative programs and to provide recommendations on policy changes for the coming year. I strongly recommend that policy 1450 be repealed of the controversial provisions hastily approved last year without parental notification or participation in the decision-making process. My opposition to this policy does not reflect a lack of concern for children wrestling with gender, with questions of gender. I do care for these children. I have a family member in the LGBT community. However, I will not at the same time abandon care for the remaining 98% of the student population who do not identify as transgender. I am deeply troubled by policy 1450 in light of the fact that nationwide distinguished members of our medical community have not yet to reach consensus on transgenderism. Consider Dr. Paul McHugh, former psychiatrist and psychiatrist in chief at John Hopkins University. He states emphatically that transgenderism is a mental disorder. Further studies from Jander Vanderbilt University reveal that for children who express transgender feelings, 70 to 80 percent of them spontaneously lost those feelings over time. To question one's natural born sex is no light matter. Let us not mistake that reality. Beyond the medical issues it presents, families facing transgenderism often require years of counseling, and yet in approving policy 1450, you have required children as young as five years old to unnecessarily face this complex question. 
children whose days consist of hide and seek, folk song, counting to 10, and exploring their backyards. You have demanded without parental notification that he accept a political answer to an inconclusive medical question that causes confusion in their own lives. This course of action not only does, does a disservice to our own children, the most innocent segment of our population, but it disrespects their personhood. Since the beginning of time, elders have protected children from complex matters. We do it in the name of innocence. In the matter of policy 1450, why have you abandoned this age-old practice? In schools, as in homes, it is our duty, our privilege, to provide children the protective barriers that not only ensure their physical safety, but will also secure their emotional and mental innocence. To that end, I ask that you repeal policy 1450 and include this as a priority in the legislative programs for this coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura Miller to be followed by John Kochka to be followed by Kathy Roos. Good evening. Hi, I am a mother of three children in elementary school here at Fairfax County Public Schools. And I am here tonight to talk about the legislative programs I wish for you to advocate for. Right now as a mom, I'm very concerned that uh, you're not achieving one of the goals that we agree with. I want my children to be the healthiest and wealthiest and wisest, as you state, and to become successful graduates and successful members of society. However, when I learn that coming soon, they're gonna be reading in English literature classes um, materials they have promiscu promiscuity throughout it, profanities, um, demonstrating violence, um, having fear of daddies. It just, it just goes on and on. I, I almost wanna pull my kids out of the schools. Um, it scares me. Uh, and then I learned that in your, your FLE, you're, you're gonna teach them anal sex at, in eighth grade. It just it baffles my mind. You're gonna be teaching them homosexuality when they don't, my kids don't even know the difference between Santa Claus and not. I'm a stay at home mom. I don't have money to go to private school. Okay, now the CDC, the newest reports say that if you really wanna achieve the healthiest and wisest of your children, you teach them to abstain from sex while they're children. They're children through 18. We have them as children until 18. They're not adults yet. They haven't even fully created the rationality in their brains yet. You need to let them reach that level. And then the CDC shows over and over that those that abstain as teenagers from sex have successful marriages. And those that have successful marriages have successful families. And they are the ones that have the wealthiest lifestyles and the most love. And that's because they learn self-control. If we don't teach our children self-control, how are they gonna have self-control as adults? And they will not. And marriage has a lot of self-control and a lot of sacrifice. And they must, must learn it when they're young. But meanwhile, your programs counter all of this. Um, and I know maybe you're saying your hands are tied and you're just following what the state wants you to follow. Well, here's your chance. Tell our state government to change things. Let's get rid of this 1450 stuff because it is not teaching them correct behaviors. It's not teaching them self-control. Not even the, the homosexuals have to have self-control too. Everybody does. It's life. Um, and then also you need to advocate for independent parental reviews so that we know what's in our literature and this is to say, no, stop this stuff. Um, and we also ought to have a law that doesn't allow transgenders under 18 to start taking hormones and, and, and uh, surgeries. It's just bad. I've over, overdone it. Yes. I'm sorry. That's all right. Thank you. John Kochka to be followed by Kathy Roos to be followed by Kimberly Begg. Virginia State Legislature should cut state funding to any Virginia school teaching the Fairfax County Family Life Education Curriculum 
or any similar curriculum. This is an excerpt from grade seven, emotional and social health lesson one. For most people, their gender identity is the same as their sex assigned at birth. For some people, it is not the same. The term transgender is used to describe an individual whose gender identity, how they think of themselves as male or female, is different from the individual's sex assigned at birth. In teaching this lesson, consider this. A student whose faith reaches back millennia brings home a test. Question, how many genders are there? If she answers two, it's marked wrong. This is a clear violation of the First Amendment rights of that student. Another student brings home a test to the question, true or false? Our gender can change from male to female and back again over the course of the lifetime. He answered false, wrong again. A student begins an essay. There are two genders, male and female, wrong once again. When FLE distinguishes biological gender from gender identity, the two terms will inevitably merge into the way kids understand gender. It's the way people talk. We hear tolerance preached, but tolerance does not extend to those who disagree with the concept of multiple genders. According to the biggest on the Fairfax County School Board, the Fairfax County Public School Administration and the Obama Administration, it does not. Whether seen through the eyes of faith, science, or reason, there are only two genders. The idea of multiple genders is wrong on religious grounds. Genesis 5-2, he created them male and female and blessed them, and he named them mankind. Was the faith of Mother Teresa in Calcutta based on hate? Was the faith of Martin Luther King, a faith that acknowledged male and female based on invidious discrimination? Was the science of Nettie Stevens who discovered the XX and XY chromosome determining biological gender, a science based on gender animus? One social media site allows a person to self-designate from a list of 50 genders, 50 genders. How many of these genders will Fairfax County School Board add in 2017? If they don't, if you don't add another 46, will the school board itself be accused of hate? Teaching our students there are multiple genders violates religious rights, defies science, and doesn't make any common sense. Thank you. Kathy Roos to be followed by Kimberly Begg to be followed by Melissa Bodine. Good evening. I'm a resident of Fairfax County. I'm a lawyer. I'm a mother of young children. My remarks address the search for a new superintendent. I recently watched a video of the board meeting of May 7th, 2015. That's when this board voted to make transgenderism an official part of school law and policy. There were hundreds of parents in this room, standing, shouting, trying to be heard. I saw this board gavel them down and threaten to kick them out. I saw you, Mr. McElveen, tell them they were on the wrong side of history, scold them. I watched the entire board vote yes and one member vote no. Thank you, Ms. Schultz, for being that no vote. Now it's important for the public to understand that this board had no authority to create a new transgender category. Virginia law is clear. Localities may not enact identity categories that are inconsistent with state law. There are even some lawyers on the board that should know better. State law does not include transgenderism, and so this board, a mere county school board, has no legal right to impose it on families in your jurisdiction. You have shown contempt for the law because you did it anyway. And the public should know you're being sued for it. 
You've showed contempt for the law and you've shown contempt for the people who pay your salaries, parents. Recently, you heard from an American Muslim father. He moved his family to Fairfax County because of the good reputation for schools in this area. But he has had to take his daughters out and put them in private schools at a cost well beyond his family's means. As you may recall, he was close to tears when he told you he can't afford to pull his young son out of public schools, a school that shows contempt for his religious beliefs. You may recall he said public schools should be for everyone, but you have made them not for him and the other Muslims, the 10,000 Muslim children in this county. Your schools are filled with Muslim families, Catholic families, evangelical Christian families, and you are forcing all these families to choose between following their deeply held religious beliefs or following your controversial policies. No family, no child should be put in this position, and yet you have done that. Let me state as plainly as I can, for these families, your policy is trying to force their children to deny a truth about the human person that is a tantamount to denying God. It is that serious for these families. You don't care. We have tremendous compassion for any person suffering with the idea that they have been born in the wrong body. This condition affects very few, and thankfully, 80% to 90% of the children up, grow please? out of it. I will. 80 to 90% of the children grow out of this. There are compassionate ways to respond to these children without forcing all children and all teachers and all families to champion an unscientific, highly controversial, highly politicized agenda. These policies must be repealed. Thank you. Kimberly Begg. Thank you for allowing me to speak on the agenda topic, legislative programs for the upcoming year. You know, because you hear from citizens at every board meeting, that many Fairfax County residents felt marginalized by our lack of transparency and hurried passage of policy 1450. I met one of those residents just last night. I was at a dress rehearsal for my seven-year-old daughter's Nutcracker performance. A mom of three children, ages six, four, and one, struck up a conversation with me. After chatting for a few minutes, she shared that she and her husband chose to live in Fairfax County when they were first married because of the excellent reputation of our schools. This woman was excited to enroll her daughter in kindergarten last year, but she soon became alarmed when her daughter told her what her teacher taught about sexual behavior, grossly inappropriate for kindergarten discussion. Then this board passed 1450, and that's when this woman withdrew her daughter from our schools. The policies of this board your obsession with sex, your celebration of sexual activity that violates the faith and religious liberty of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, leaves parents no choice but to opt out of our schools. The woman I met last night is now homeschooling and looking for a job so she and her husband can afford private school tuition for their two oldest children and a nanny for her baby. I have heard the same story from many parents and so have you. A Muslim man stood before you a few weeks ago in anguish over your violation of his religious liberty. As he told his story, I saw the reactions of members of this board. You listened to him. When he told you his wife had to find a job for the first time so they could afford private school tuition and the cost of uniforms, I saw your faces. You listened. I have come before this board before and shared my family's situation. My husband and I have five children. We are forced to support the schools through our tax payments, but we will not send our children to these schools in their current state. My husband and I both work demanding jobs outside our home to cover the extra cost of school. While we work during the day, our three oldest children attend private school. Our four-year-old attends a half-day preschool, and our precious two-year-old spends long days with our sitter. I beg you, please, consider what you are doing and why you are doing it. You have been entrusted with the oversight of the education of our country's children. Please teach our children math, teach them to love to read, teach them literature. I beg you, please stop this social engineering. 
In a school district in Minnesota, girls no longer have the right to undress in locker rooms without biological males. A group of girls there will never unsee what they have been forced to see. A biological male with a penis asserting his right to access their once private space, twerking, grinding, and lifting up his skirt to reveal his underwear in front of the girls, even allowing two of them, even following two of them to a secondary locker room to undress in front of them when they sought privacy. It is not too late to protect the children of Fairfax County. Thank you. Melissa Bojan. Good evening. Honorable school board members, my name is Melissa Bodwin. I hold a doctor in political science and currently I serve this community as a professor at Nova Community College. I live in the Mason District and more specifically St. Albans Precinct. It is an honor to address you all this evening. The following are my thoughts and recommendations for the legislative programs and the upcoming policies for the coming year. First of all, because it is the role of the legislative branch of government to write and pass policy through legislation, it is recommended that the school board reject President Obama's illegal and harmful mandate to force transgender mandates on public schools. Besides having no lawful basis, Obama's federal mandates actually violate Title IX and discriminates against females by forcing males access to female bathrooms, showers, and locker rooms. It also discriminates against females by disregarding their right to privacy and safety. Moreover, on August 21, 2016, United States District Federal Gu uh, Judge of Texas, Reed O'Connor, ruled in the case of the state of Texas v. the United States of America that the Obama administration's transgender directives in the enforcing federal agencies have exceeded the authority given them by the 1972 Title IX Education Amendments. He ordered a nationwide injunction against the directives. In his injunction, he wrote, and I quote, it cannot be disputed, disputed that the plain meaning of the term sex in that law meant the biological and anatomical differences between male and female students as a detriment or as determined by their birth. Without question, permitting educational institutions to provide separate housing to male and female students and separate educational instruction concerning human sexuality was to protect students personal privacy or discuss their personal privacy of in, in matters of sexual orientation while in the presence of members of the opposite biological sex. However, the Fairfax County School Board has not retracted their policy. In fact, members of the school board, are, uh, school board assert that you have been working on and under the following direction, and I quote, of the courts and the, the federal government. I received this quote in response of an email that I sent to Sandy Evans on July 12. If you are indeed working under the guidance of the courts, then why have you not abandoned these illegal mandates issued by the executive branch in violation of their authority, but choose to ignore ruling from the judiciary, which is acting within its constitutional parameters? In closing, I ask you to repeal Act 450. Thank you. Robert Rigby. I apologize. I've left my notes at home, so I have to use this infernal device. Um, good evening. My name is Robert Rigby. I've been a teacher in FCPS for nearly 18 years and am the current president of a certified employees group called SCPS Pride. We are a gathering of those who hold the interests of LGBT staff members, LGBT students and their families, and LGBT parents close to our hearts. I noted in looking at the proposed 2017 legislative program that Section J includes advocating for the passage and ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Although that amendment doesn't necessarily affect SCPS policies directly, I would think that it is there for a number of other reasons. First, to make writing equitable policies for SCPS easier. And second, 
to protect students, parents, and families in the larger community in which they live, especially in the workforce. Healthy families mean healthy and thriving students, and I can see how the board would take an interest in ensuring that our students, family members, and the older students who are seeking employment are treated fairly. For several years, several delegates, including Mark Levine, our own Scott Servell, Adam Eben, Alfonso Lopez, and Marcus Simon, have proposed to the General Assembly that they add sexual orientation and gender identity to the Virginia Human Rights Act. Um, uh, let me see. LGBT people within the walls of our Fairfax County Public School buildings are well served by the current board policies. But outside of schools, our students' families who may be LGBT or who come under fire for standing up for an LGBT child remain vulnerable. If families lose ground in housing, employment, and post-secondary education, this directly impacts our students. Thus, it makes sense to me for the SCPS School Board to advocate for an update to the Virginia Human Rights Act to include sexual orientation and gender identity to defend the families of our students. We already so advocate with the Equal Rights Amendment, I assume for similar reasons. While I do not think that human rights should be decided on a majority vote, it is worth noting that all five statewide elected officials in Virginia support such an addition, as do most of the members of Fairfax County's delegation to the General Assembly. I would also speculate, and it's just speculation, from the recent election results that a majority of voters in all magisterial districts do likewise. All members of the SCPS School Board have a reputation I'm almost out of time. Um, Y'all are known for voting in the student's interest. You really are. All of you are. Um, I think adding this to the Virginia Human Rights Act would be in our students' interest because it's in the interest of their families. My time is up. Thank you. Debbie Munoz to be followed by Mike Ney. Hi, my name is Debbie Munoz. It's my anniversary, and instead of spending it the normal way, I'm here to talk about money. But it's not just any money, it's my livelihood. Tonight, you are reviewing the 2017 budget and letting new construction contracts. And my question to all of you is, how can you even think of asking for more money for the budget when you don't care about what happens to the existing money you have? How can you think of letting new contracts for construction when you don't enforce the contracts in place now? How do I know this? Because I've been personally affected by the fact that there is no transparency or accountability with the FCPS system. I imagine nobody in this room can afford to lose $212,000, but that's what's happened to me. It's happening to me now at the hands of the board. I'm a subcontractor on the Cherry Run Elementary School project. The board has approved and paid the general contractor for my work, but I haven't received a dime of the money owed to me since July 1st. And all of you have known about it for a month. You've all been informed. None of you care if a subcontractor gets stiffed or if it looks like the GC is engaging in a prima facie intent to fraud. To defraud. Read Virginia Code Section 43-13 and you'll see what I mean. As long as you're getting your school built, it appears you're washing your hands of this, and I'm being told it's my problem. By your contract, the GC has to pay subs within seven days of receiving payment from you. But that didn't happen. And here are the ways that FCPS and the board has dodged accountability. We asked in writing that the payment provisions be enforced, denied. The payments be stopped to the GC until all subcontractors are paid up to date, denied to be paid directly by C FCPS, denied. The de FCPS clawback amounts already paid to the GC, denied. That the GC's project manager, who seems to be a major source of the problems on the Cherry Run project, be removed, denied. And finally, we asked in writing that a complete investigation and audit of the project occur, and it was denied. All these measures are available to the board in the contract for construction. And speaking of my audit request, where is the Auditor General? 
Are you all aware <clears throat> that the Auditor General of the FCPS has been on paid administrative leave since July? There's no, there's no transparency and there's no accountability here. One more point about transparency. When excuses were made by a FCPS rep about payment to me, excuses disparaging my work, I filed a FOIA to get evidence of our performance. And the FOIA request for all intents and purposes was obstructed. No transparency there, no accountability. And I ask you tonight to please look for accountability, look for transparency, find it within yourself to review this matter. Thank you. Mike Nee. School board of members, as a CPA with 20 years experience, I'm talking about 2017 mid-year budget. The mission of the school board is to provide high quality education. So the budget has to be student-centered budget. When you work in a glassy, sexy building, my child study in the trailer room with no water, no bathroom access, that spending is ill spent. That's not student-centered budget. When the students are forced to spend 36 hours per year on sex education based on the ill-conceived 1450, that is not a student-centered budget. The money, the resource, and the materials could well be spent on reading, math, science, and technology. By looking at this chart, in the past five years, the school budget increased 100%. The student enrollment only increased 20%. Budget spent five times more than the students. The money is not spent on the students. It's on something else. That is not a student-centered budget. As a CPA, I urge you to do two things. One is rehire back the general auditor to con conduct a comprehensive investigation and audit to identify the waste and the abuses. Any report shows that $470 million spent on special education. That is 22% of school budget, higher than middle school spending. 472 million students spending on a single day to students truly need special education. There must be some waste out there. There must be some savings you can achieve to do something about it. Second thing, conduct a study of the undocumented illegal immigrants. With this sending thousands of thousands of students into our county system, enjoy free benefits of health care and free education. Who is going to pay for that? In my view, the people let them in, they should be responsible for that. Because it's not fair to put a financial burden on the, our state government, it's not fair to put a burden on you, the county official, and it's not fair to put a burden on me and us, the working classes, law bending, tax paying, and hard working citizens. As a CPA, I strongly urge you to re establish a well balanced and reasonable, responsible school budget for 2017. Thank you so much. Thank you. We go to uh, 3.02 student representative matters, and I call on Ms. Chu. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I would just like to welcome the Boy Scouts in the audience. If you could please stand to be recognized. They're here working on their citizenship in the community badge. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. I also have um, a few other things I would like to give. First, I would like to thank Robinson Secondary School for hosting our recent Superintendent Student Advisory Council meeting. It was a very emotional meeting as our students had a final chance to say farewell to Dr. Garza. So I'd just like to say thank you again to the school for hosting a wonderful meeting. I would also like to thank Leah Skirpsky and Jennifer Spears from the School Health Advisory Committee, as well as their student representative, Jenna Kaufman, who came to our Superintendent Student Advisory Council meeting to present on mental health and wellness. 
The SAC voted on three aspects of mental health and wellness to focus on for the remainder of the year and concluded with one, health in a safe school environment, two, family and community involvement, and three, health education. In addition, the students discussed an initiative called SACNSHAC in collaboration with the School Health Advisory Committee to showcase school wellness and discuss those three aspects of mental wellness throughout our schools. I would also like to thank Lauren Anderson from the Josh Anderson Foundation for presenting about Our Minds Matter, a student-led movement to change school culture about mental health. So thank you so much for all of you for coming out to our meeting. I'm looking forward this upcoming Monday to further discuss these issues and I hope that any students who would like to participate with the Anderson Foundation and or the community initiatives we're taking could reach out. Finally, Real Food for Kids and their student representative, a good friend of my Susie Bay, I would just like to thank, is in the process of putting together a youth student health advocacy board. The board will be responsible for meeting with our director of food and nutrition services, as well as his nutritionist and food services team to provide feedback on SCPS food, as well as ed advocate on the student level through Real Food for Kids. If there are any students interested in joining this board, please let me know and I would be happy to connect you to the organization. And that is all. Thank you, Ms. Chu. 4.01, confirmation of action taken in closed meeting. This is the portion of the meeting where the board will confirm any action regarding issues that were discussed in the closed meeting. These issues may include action taken regarding student disciplinary matters. Board members have discussed each individual case and at this time will make several motions to confirm the recommendation, recommended action. And I call on Ms. Schultz for the uh, first motion. Yes, um, I move to grant the school, oh, I'm sorry. We're out of order. This is uh, M1, yeah. the... Uh, yeah, we have them on both sides. Okay. Yeah. Um, I move to excuse from attendance at school certain students identified in a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code section 22.1-254B1. Do I have a second? Seconded by second. Mr. Moon. All those in favor, raise your hand. Uh, it, uh, Palchik, Huff, Schultz, Strauss, Evans, Moon. All those opposed? McLaughlin, all those abstaining? Corbett Sanders, Wilson, and McElveen. That motion passes. I now call on Ms. Uh, Stra uh, Strauss for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who threatened another student and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Mrs. Schultz. All those in favor, raise your hand. Huff, Schultz, Strauss, Evans, Moon, and McElveen. All those opposed? Palchik. All those abstaining? Corbett Sanders, uh, McLaughlin, and Wilson. And that motion passes. I call on Ms. Palchuk for a motion. I, Madam Chair, I move that the school board permit an individual to enter onto school property in limited circumstances and according to the terms and conditions discussed in closed session. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Strauss. All those in favor, raise your hand. Palchuk, Corbett Sanders, Strauss, Evans, Moon, and uh, McElveen, all those opposed? Schultz, all those abstaining? Huff, McLaughlin, and Wilson, that motion passes. We turn to item 4.02, the 2017-2018 school year calendar, and I call on Mr. Moon for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the school board approve the recommended 2017-2018 school year calendar. Do I have a second? Seconded by Ms. Palchuk. Mr. Moon, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, just briefly, Madam Chair. Uh, as we all remember, the school board made a decision last year from FY18, we would, school year 18 would start the school year prior to the Labor Day. And as directed by the school board, the staff developed the calendar with that pre-Labor Day start. And uh, staff came up with uh, two different proposals and we had work sessions to have a discussion on those two different proposals. 
and then also survey the community, parents and teachers, and even non-FCPS you know, people, and overwhelmingly in all those three different categories, there was a support for draft number seven. And some of the things you might wanna know under draft number seven is that the first day of school for the students will be August 28th, that is a year from now, almost a year from now, and then school year will end for the students on June 15, 2018. That calendar, which we'll be voting on, which I support, has a two full weeks of a winter break plus January 1, and also provides one full week of spring break plus Monday after spring break. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Palchik, would you like to speak to your second? Yes, thank you, also briefly. Um, first of all, I wanted to echo Mr. Moon's um, comments that we did have uh, extensive feedback through the online survey. I also want to thank um, the community members who emailed or who met with me to discuss the calendar. Uh, I, I will be in a future forum topic um, asking that we have a calendar committee that can work with our staff in the future, it's very loud today, uh, staff in the future um, to ensure that we have consistent um, community input from our stakeholders as we create the calendar process. Uh, that being said, I wanna thank Mr. Smith um, for all your work on this and your staff. Uh, I know it's a, uh, a long process. We seem usually the end, um, and I know it takes uh, quite a bit of input from stakeholders and the community. Um, I also do look forward to working on guidance um, to help ensure that our schools are mindful and, and understanding of um, religious observances um, for families and, and what that means and the impact on that. So with that being said, happy to second this, and I hope our colleagues will join us in supporting this calendar that starts a week before Labor Day. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Schultz. So um, I, I typically vote for the calendar because at this point we've arrived at a, a fair degree of public engagement um, and the board has had a lot of work with staff. Um, but I, I'm going to um, dissent on this calendar not because of the pre-Labor Day start, because I actually think that's a good idea. I think our colleagues in um, Montgomery County are playing like opposite land or opposite day um, to us. Um, and they're being pushed for the same reasons uh, that I think we're um, extracting ourselves from a start date that bows um, for decades to an industry of, um, uh, what you call it industry uh, hospitality yeah a tourism a hospitality industry instead of what's right for children so in that aspect I think the calendar is um, is good um, what I'm starting to have a problem with is and what I heard a lot from my constituents was that by the time there was an opportunity for the public to have input it was draft seven or draft eight it was it was a binary choice and that Really, I think the board um, is going to be responsible going forward, and and I'm kind of sad that the public engagement committee didn't take up a greater engagement with the public over tightening the school year. And the fact that we've heard from a lot of families that say, look, you have us getting out the second or the third week of June, and remember, if we move back a week, you get out a week early, you know, you're not going to school longer, you're going to school the same amount of time, the question is when, and that's in relation to the standardized tests that happen and are normed nationally. And if you have students um, across the United States that are going to school, frankly, at the be beginning of August in many cases, they have that much more of a jump on um, classroom time to standardize tests, and that's why we're moving it. But it's all the other days, it's all the other staff development days, all the other breaks that happen um, that lengthen the school year and the question about whether or not we really need to be discussing um, padding either the front end of the calendar before kids come to school with um, enough professional development for staff and or at the back end um, and have a consistent calendar that is tightened up that allows um, students to 
uh, work more over uh, the summer holidays um, if they need to be employed or um, to frankly just be consistently in school and that all of the um, three and a half, four day weeks over and over and over throughout the calendar um, wreak havoc not only on students um, but on families as well. And I don't know that we've had that full um, part of the conversation, the board ourselves. We sort of just start wherever we landed off la last year. Um, I'm not gonna do my, my annual speech on um, Veterans Day because we're blessed that next year Veterans Day happens to be on a weekend, but I am gonna use it as a precursor to the fact that um, Boy, if you haven't ever seen me fight for Veterans Day as the only federal holiday not recognized on Fairfax County's calendar before, you're gonna see it in next year because even though Veterans Day is on Saturday this coming school year, I will bet you know we're gonna find a way to have Veterans Day celebrations in all of our schools on a not Veterans Day day, which is exactly the point that I always make on why we absolutely can honor veterans and the deep military commitment we have um, throughout our community. Uh, but we can have Veterans Day and still have where, where the schools do hold them wonderful Veterans Day observances. So I know that's, um, you know, probably was not expected by some of my colleagues, but I am gonna be um, refraining from supporting this calendar, um, not because it wasn't good work by staff, but frankly, I think it's, I'm trying to foreshadow, I think some of the work that needs to come by the board uh, for, for future calendars and, and represent the voices that certainly have been heard that are unhappy with this calendar. Mrs. Huff. Uh, so I, I think I'll have to ask Ms. Palchek if I can jump in on her forum topic because that was exactly what I was going to say. Uh, I am going to support the calendar given the survey results. Uh, the majority of the community did speak on the two draft calendar options and that was the one. So I will be supporting that, but I absolutely agree with um, my two previous colleagues that just spoke to the fact that I was, I was a little shocked at the, um, at how little community input from a board and a public standpoint there was done. I, I know that Mr. Smith and staff have done an excellent job personally going out to the um, certain group stakeholders and getting input as they build the calendar, but I do think it's appropriate for us to have it in a little bit more of a public forum so that we can bounce ideas off of each other, hear each other's thinking, and um, have a wider variety of options when we do survey the community. So thank you. Mr. McElveen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually just have um, one question, and um, it pertains to the G, um, which is in, on the calendar in um, June 2018, some, a designation I've never seen before um, on our calendars. And I know um, Mr. Curran isn't here tonight, but hopefully someone will be able to answer this question. So, um, you know, we always have a practice of not wanting students to have to wait around for graduation ceremonies after school ends. And it looks like we're accomplishing that by starting graduations on the 7th of June, um, but I'm wondering how that pertains to our contracts with, um, with Eagle Bank Arena and, and um, uh, DAR, Constitution Hall. Um, are, we, are we committed to ending graduations by the last day of school on the 15th? How does that look? Can anyone provide more information on that? So w with regard to the graduation dates, uh, the process, we've used this in the past, uh, for graduations, it's basically seven days from the last day of school. Uh, it's been that way since we've been doing graduations and developing calendars. Uh, we we're uh, told by uh, Mr. Curran that uh, this date will work for our calendar for next year, uh, and we will be okay moving forward with it. Okay, great. Um, if I could, I, I might ask for more information at a later date, but thank you for that. Mrs. Strong. I will vote for the calendar. I was very pleased that the community did weigh in with the electronic survey. Um, we did get thousands of responses and uh, consequently um, what is being proposed tonight is uh, what was voted on by the community. 
um, so thank you for those of you who responded to our question as to what you would prefer. And um, uh, it was interesting, the two weeks for the winter break, uh, is, as it turns out, is what was the preferred um, calendar situation by the community. So that's, that's what is on the table. Um, in putting the calendar together, there's always the challenge of uh, uh, balancing quarters, balancing semesters, keeping in mind um, those holidays that are traditional in our community. And most importantly, or I should say as importantly, is providing um, uh, the professional days for our teachers to do their work, uh, whether it is planning for the next quarter, uh, getting the grades in the grade books, et cetera. So those days where the, well, the students may have a holiday, the teachers are working very hard. It is, those days are very, very important to our staff. So I will be supporting this calendar. And again, thank you to the community for weighing in on this. It helped. Mrs. Corbett Sanders. Thank you. Um, I too will be supporting the calendar as it's been recommended tonight, but I will also be supporting Ms. Palchuk's uh, recommendation that we have a community um, group come together with the school system to um, help develop the calendar because as I um, sent the draft calendars out to my um, constituents, I got a lot of feedback as to um, request for additional or other um, dates that might have been more um, supportive of family interest. But I am going to be supporting this calendar tonight because uh, we have a commitment to all of our community to allow community members to provide feedback, to be part of the decision-making process, but also to have reliability. And by adopting the calendar tonight, we send a message to our community members that when they go home for the holidays at the winter break, they can make plans for their holidays this summer and they can make plans for their holidays next year. And so um, kicking this down the road really doesn't make sense uh, for us tonight. But I will encourage that going forward um, that we uh, perhaps put together a um, task force with community members. I will, and I wanna remind people that we actually went through two separate community engagement processes on this. We engaged the community last spring as to whether or not we should be um, starting school, taking advantage of a waiver that we could take advantage of with the state of Virginia. Um, and then once that engagement process was over, we instructed the school um, staff to put together draft calendars. And it was the second initiative that we went back to the community to talk about what was the preferred calendar. Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, I will support the calendar based on the community input we received, but I did want to speak to a couple things. First of all, we had some in the community who were still trying to understand um, how does Fairfax County handle its snow days? Um, you know, for years and years, um, when we had a certain number of snow days, uh, then the question became um, beyond you know, the three that we put into the end of the school year, did it mean uh, now students would have to go extra days, l um, lose vacation days, uh, you know, how was that being handled? And uh, what I wanted to make sure everybody understood was that once Fairfax County Schools was able to convert to full day Mondays, uh, we no longer found ourselves in the dilemma of how do we fulfill the state requirements of either 180 days of instruction, or then if you have some snow days, can you then um, convert to the 990 hours of instruction? And um, the combination of the full day Mondays, which enabled our elementary schools to then better align with our middle and high school hours of instruction, along with the fact that we've had some heavy snow years, which meant Fairfax County qualified for the waiver, um, essentially what it meant is that we no longer had to build in snow days and wonder if they got used or unused. Um, and so that was, I th think, for some families trying to understand why are we still then ending uh, really later in June than we would hope. And Ms. Schultz kind of touched upon 
um, the added dilemma that I think going into next year's calendar development, you've heard many of our colleagues tonight expressing support of having a stakeholder working group um, because I think it would be helpful to our, our staff and our school system to kind of have some additional perspectives coming to the table. Uh, because I do think that um, while we want to balance out the professional development days uh, for our employees, what that has meant is we sprinkle in a lot of student holidays in there, or teacher work days, which equates to then a student holiday, um, sprinkled throughout the school year. And for uh, dual working families um, where childcare is an issue, uh, I think that does present a problem for families at times. And so uh, I think there needs to be some broader discussion on that. Uh, because as of now, we are starting a week earlier, but we're not necessarily seeing a, a big translation in terms of a much earlier end date in June. Um, I, I also um, have, I guess, a little bit of angst about the fact that uh, we are starting a week before Labor Day, and that was a real feel-good moment for a lot of people who felt that we needed to start earlier and help our students get that extra week of preparation. Um, for uh, tests at the state level and the national level that we can't control. Um, but I, I struggled with it personally because in terms of the high school level, um, high schools are on a block schedule. So we start a week early, it doesn't mean five extra days of instruction that the students are gonna necessarily cover. I mean, they're gonna meet with those classes maybe two more extra days. And so for some of us who were raised on the beauty of summer began in June and you didn't go back until the day after Labor Day. Uh, I think there's uh, some of us, and, and the survey even showed it, it was pretty close um, where people stood on a whole in terms of our families on pre-Labor Day, post-Labor Day start. So um, I, again, uh, recognize that anytime you're trying to make a calendar for not just 187,000 students and their families, um, but 27, 28,000 employees in the school system. It's a lot of uh, personal schedules that we're trying to accommodate and work towards. Um, so uh, I appreciate that Ms. Chapalchuk has you know, formally put forward something that many of us have been hearing from the community and agree with and believe it's the right thing to do. Um, and it's just gonna be a matter of how we uh, work with staff. And then finally, for those of um, who know, I have joined Ms. Schultz each year in advocating for Veterans Day to be recognized. And uh, because it falls on a Saturday, uh, this was the year she and I weren't gonna have to get up and lobby for this, but it just means this year it was a reprieve. It doesn't excuse the fact that I do still strongly believe that this school system um, can and should be recognizing Veterans Day. And I look forward to um, that future um, advocacy uh, a year from now. Thank you, and I'll uh, make just a few brief comments myself. I uh, will be supporting this calendar. I very much welcome the pre-Labor Day start, even though um, I know there's a bit of nostalgia to starting after Labor Day. In uh, my community, we have a prototype of starting before Labor Day. We did have a period of time when Stewart High School, Falls Church High School, and Glasgow started two weeks earlier, uh, two weeks before Labor Day, and then ended two weeks uh, before the rest of the school system did. And I, I think after um, a, a bit of getting used to that, uh, which uh, was actually very quick getting used to it, that the community accepted that and I think overall welcomed it. And um, I uh, certainly appreciate Ms. Palchek's idea of having a, a calendar committee. I do believe we got significant input in a, in a number of ways from our employee groups, from a survey that we did on the pre-Labor Day start, and, um, and then on, uh, on a survey about um, that essentially was asking whether you wanted a shorter winter break and get out um, earlier in June. Um, and I, I believe that was fairly overwhelming that uh, both employees and parents welcomed having a full two weeks of winter break. So that that is reflected in the calendar that we're um, about to vote on tonight. Um, I continue to have um, concerns uh, about our uh, major religious holidays. 
Um, and I would hope that one of the things that the, uh, and I know Ms. Palchuk uh, is, uh, feels strongly about this as well, so I would hope that that would be uh, something that, uh, Ms. Palchuk, you, you look like you wanted to comment on yes, that. Yes, I would want input from um, the Fairfax County Clergy and Leadership Council at the very least, so make sure that there are members, there's already a council working with the county. As part of the, the, as, the group that you're going to yes. suggest, so uh, w I think we'll all look forward to seeing your mm -hmm. forum topic on that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I do think that uh, while we do try very hard to make sure that all of the schools, all the principals, administrators, teachers are aware ahead of time of religious holidays so that they don't put tests and, and field trips and anything important on days where they might have a number of students out uh, for religious observations, um, I do think that uh, there's probably more we can do at, at the very least in communication. So I w I'll welcome uh, that being part of the committee as well. So with, uh, I see Mr. Moon's hand. Uh, Ms. Evans, just one quick note that for this school year, the last day of the school for the students is June 23rd. Mm -hmm. Now the calendar will be, adop will be voting on and it will be adopted, I, you know, you know, sounding like uh, there's a majority support for that. The last day will be June 15. So we will be starting about a week earlier and ending about a week earlier. As we are, as I was looking at this proposal, this proposal calendar, I did not certainly expect to be able to end much earlier than one week compared to this week because we would be starting only one week earlier than this year. Thank you, and seeing no more uh, comments, uh, I will take the vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I need to reread the motion. Um, the motion is uh, that the school board approve the recommended 2017 to 18 school year calendar. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Palchik, Huff, Corbett Sanders, Strauss, Evans, Moon, McLaughlin, Wilson, McElveen, all those opposed, Schultz, and that motion passes. Item 4.03, Fairfax County School Board 2017 State and Federal Legislative Program. I call in Mr. McElveen for the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the school board adopt and approve the recommended 2017-18 school year, or sorry, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> we just did that. <laughs> I move that the board adopt the 2017 State and Federal Legislative Program. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Uh, Mrs. Corbett Sanders. Mr. McElveen, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just add that this is the perfect segue going from a conversation about the King's Dominion Law. Um, and I would just remind everyone that we are in this legislative program still advocating for um, school boards to have local control um, as it pertains to their school calendars um, under the King's Dominion Law. Um, because remember that for this coming year and the coming uh, forthcoming couple of years, uh, we have received a, a waiver from the state um, on that provision. So um, it's still something that we confront at the state level. Uh, so regarding the um, legislative program as a whole, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is our um, annual legislative program adoption. Uh, there are minimal uh, changes from past years, uh, but I would um, highlight that the most important change um, in our advocacy in this program uh, regards the VRS, the Virginia Retirement System, and particularly um, our advocacy uh, is uh, uh, pertains to returning VRS payments to the original uh, timeline uh, of reaching 100% of the full actuarial rate um, in 2019 as opposed to 2018. Um, and as my colleagues know very well, we have sent advocacy letters uh, from the chair on behalf of the board uh, to our state delegation and to our uh, state officials, and um, this will remain our top priority this year. Um, I would also um, just note very briefly uh, that our legislative priorities list has been reconfigured um, slightly since the work session we had uh, based on board member feedback um, that it was a bit unwieldy at, at um, six or seven items. So um, what our, um, our talented uh, um, uh, legislative uh, li liaison to the state, um, uh, Mr. Malloy, has done ha is uh, reconstructed this under two uh, uh, broad umbrella priorities, the first of which is providing adequate state support for public education, and the second is preserving local school board authority and flexibility. 
um, I think we will all agree that those are our, um, our uh, overwhelming two top priorities. Uh, so with that, I would just um, uh, tell the public that this board uh, remains um, even more committed to engaging with Richmond this year, particularly on the VRS issue. Uh, and I would like to um, thank uh, Mr. Malloy for his help in uh, once again crafting um, this program. Thank you, Mrs. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you to Mr. McElveen for his excellent work in uh, leading the effort, especially at the um, state level, working with Mr. Malloy organizations. Mr. Malloy, um, for those of you who don't know, is our um, legislative person in the um, county, but he's also an expert that's relied upon by uh, not only our school system, but, the, uh, but many other smaller school systems across the state. Um, it is an area where Fairfax County does take leadership in putting, crafting a legislative program uh, that reflects the priorities of public schools across the state. In particular this year, there is a priority in the legislative program to um, ensure that we have adequate funding for our schools. And that is why you will see the language on the um, slowing down the repayment or the uh, adjustments to the VRS to, uh, to the original plan. It's also why um, in a few moments I'll be putting forth a, an amendment that will uh, require or request the assistance of our um, third primary funding body because we have the bulk of our funding for our schools comes from Fairfax County government and therefore the Fairfax County taxpayer. Our secondary funder is the state uh, government and this uh, Richmond legislature and our third is the federal government and so you will see a um, priority in the legislative package to ensure that we get the adequate funds. Thank you. Now I'm going to call on Mrs. Corbett Sanders for an amendment. Uh, what we can go back to uh, discussion on the main motion, but now um, Ms. Corbett Sanders, you have an amendment. Yes, thank you. I move to amend the 2017 state and federal legislative program by inserting impact aid as a new subheader after the Title I subheader with the position language included below and by deleting the phrase to offset the local impact of federally connected students and impacts associated with the Federal Base Realignment and Closure Commission's BRAC relocation decisions, impact aid, from uh, position fed.10. The FCSB supports full funding for the Federal Impact Aid Program, which is intended to offset the local impact of federally connected students, as well as those associated with federal military base relocation decisions. The FCSB supports additional impact aid funding support to address the impacts of particular concentrations of military connected families within localities. The FCSB supports additional impact aid funding support for students with disabilities who receive special needs exemptions to attend military connected schools. The FCSB supports revisions to the impact aid eligibility identification process, which would automatically opt in any student with a military student identifier. Do I have a second? Second? Yes. Oh, sorry. seconded by Ms. McLaughlin. Um, uh, Mrs. Corbett Sanders, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, um, since the, the impact aid program was designed by the federal government as a mechanism to uh, assist local governments in the funding of public schools in the United States to compensate for um, students that attend the public schools um, where they don't necessarily have um, contributions to the tax base because the majority of the uh, funding for our public schools comes from the local tax base. This program has been in effect since the late 60s and has been chronically underfunded. Here in Fairfax County, we are absolutely passionate about it, making sure that each of our students uh, that uh, attend our schools gets a um, excellent education. But we are constantly, or we have lately, faced um, underfunding at both the state and federal level. And so this is a way of prioritizing to ensure that we get the funding that is committed to by the federal government under federal law. Ms. McLaughlin, would you like to speak to your second? 
just that um, I very much appreciate the work um, Ms. Corbett Sanders has done on this. It's something she and I have talked about. Um, when we uh, look at uh, the challenges um, that Fairfax County, uh, not only the school system, but our, our county residents as a whole, uh, trying to ensure um, adequate funding for all students. And when the federal government um, has indicated that it is going to provide um, the financial supports needed um, when we have our military families stationed here and attending Fairfax County Schools, it's important that they honor that commitment. Um, it's important for our military families and it's important for all students um, here in our school system. And so I really appreciate uh, Karen's initiative on this because uh, it is something that this board has discussed for years. Uh, you know, recently when we talked about the impact of unaccompanied minors and uh, their coming into our school system having been placed um, in the, the county um, by the federal government, we felt just as important then that the federal government impacting our enrollment needed to um, also provide the supports as, as needed. And uh, I believe that Ms. Corbett Sanders has crafted language that really helps um, uh, shine a very important light on um, what uh, this area that has such a very high um, proportion of military students, and yet the federal government hasn't been um, paying um, appropriately to support their education and the impact that it has on all our students. So I very much hope that all of our colleagues will join um, Ms. Corbett Sanders and I in supporting this amendment to the legislative package. Mrs. Strauss. Thank you. I will support the amendment. Um, we are very proud of our military families and their children and we are very grateful for the service that they provide to all of us. Um, and it is, it is a blessing that so many military families are here and, uh, and it is not unusual for families to ask to be stationed here so that their children can attend Fairfax County Public Schools. Um, it is important that the funding come that is part of uh, the impact aid agreement. So it is important that we get the share that we are supposed to get, but at the same time, it's not just a monetary situation, but I think it also should, it's pride in the military service for our families. Um, we owe their children the very best education that we can provide for them and I think the federal government needs to support us in the way in which we support our military families. Thanks. I'm uh, not seeing any other hands in our, oh, um, Mrs. Schultz. So um, I feel like I'm the salmon swimming upstream but that's nothing new. Um, I'm not going to be supporting uh, the legislative um, package, um, although I am going to, where's Mr. Malloy? I am so grateful that at long last we have um, an ordered and numbered set of priorities here um, and down to two at the beginning. Um, so just I, a question, Mrs. Schultz, are you t speaking to the amendment? Um, I'm not speaking to the amendment. Okay. We're still on the amendment. We're still on the amendment. Well, uh, you know what? Then okay. I'll, I'll hold so uh, if you just hold that thought and I'll, because th we are going to first vote that, on the amendment that, and then That was I called a precursor. Okay. You foreshadowed some comments. Uh, with that, if we could have uh, a show of hands, all those, um, the amendment under consideration is the one just recently read by Mrs. Corbett Sanders. All those in favor? And that is unanimous with um, Mrs. Hines, Ms. Hines and uh, Ms. Darnett Kofax away from the table. Um, and now we go back to the uh, main motion. And now I will call on Mrs. Schultz. Da, da, da. I had to pick up where I left off. Um, I, was, I was, Mr. Malloy, somewhat chagrined to find that 26 letters of the alphabet weren't enough um, that we had to go into a second layer of the alphabet in order to even get all of the sub um, uh, bullets. And I think we're probably fewer than 280, but it, we're still way up there. Um, my main objections um, remain what they have been um, in the past. And um, I don't see Mr. Rigby, he's not here anymore. Um, never have supported uh, us as a school board, as a local school board, as a local school board, including in our legislative package, pushing for a federal constitutional amendment for the equal rights of women. I do not understand why 
that, I mean, you want to talk about um, way off the beaten path. We have no business as a local school board talking about federal amendments to the U.S. Constitution, number one. So, by the way, I, you know, that works across the board, so I'm a woman and I still don't support it. Um, uh, second of all, um, we still have a lot of extraneous um, bullet points in here, and considering what we've seen happen um, in Columbus this week, um, the fact that we're proclaiming somehow we're gonna keep children safer by advocating as a school board a zoning issue of where gun stores are located, and that that somehow keeps students safe, um, that's a political agenda that doesn't belong in our, um, in our school legislative agenda. And I think that we could help our state legislators, both um, our state house and our state senators, if we chose, if we had a legislative package just one year that was maybe two pages long, that had a couple of bullets on the first page that said this is what we want our, our uh, senators and this is what we want our state house of delegates to concentrate on, nothing else. Leave all of it aside, rescind all of the political activism, rescind all of the positions that don't have anything to do with moving the dial. Let's pick one or two things and say this is what will make the difference in a classroom. This is what will make the difference for a teacher. This is what will make the difference for a family. And this is what will make the difference for a taxpayer. And if we can get down to, um, instead of producing more, as more makes it look like we're doing more, um, do less and achieve more. And um, I know that that's like an, somehow like an odd notion that if, government concentrated on just a couple of things that maybe we would do everything we do a lot better. Um, but if fully funding um, the SOQs would make a difference for Fairfax County, then our legislative package should say, we want to fully you to fully fund the SOQs. We don't want any unfunded mandates. Done. Get us all in a, a Fairfax County school bus, drag the entire school board down, spend an entire day, um, sitting in front of our legislators and explaining to them what will make a difference. And I think it's very, very difficult when you have, you know, double sets of alphabets with many, many, many bullets underneath. And so um, for, for those reasons, um, I, I, I laud where we've gone. It's a huge improvement um, from when I started on the board five years ago, six, almost six years ago at this point. Um, but we're not there yet. Ms. McLaughlin. So first of all, I have a question um, for Mr. Malloy. Um, I'm looking on page 13, uh, where we talk about standards of accreditation and standards of learning. And during the board's work session, uh, one of the things that I found most compelling in the dialogue was the dis the the emphasis on the fact that the federal government only requires 17 of uh, these um, standardized tests to ensure uh, student accountability, and yet um, the Commonwealth of Virginia requires 29 um, SOLs. And so one of the things we talked about was, as a school system that's not only the largest in the Commonwealth, but 10th largest in the United States, we've wanted to be a leader in this sort of standardized testing um, reform um, effort. And I, I'm just wondering where in this legislative package did any of this get highlighted? Because that to me was such a key data point that we really, by federal standards, only need 17. We've got the General Assembly that's shoving 29 and parents and students and teachers are frustrated by it. And it's, at, and it's I'm sure comes at a cost as well when we're administering 29 ex um, exams versus 17. So I, would, I truly appreciate that when you have 12 school board voices in a work session, it's a lot to keep track of. Um, but if it can't be added in here, I, I would like to understand how we didn't get that captured because I do think it's one of the most compelling things that our state legislators, some who are following this topic know the importance, but when I mention it to people in the public, their eyes get so wide 
realizing that we're essentially giving 12 more SOLs than even the federal government's, you know, requiring we do. Well, the, uh, actually two things. One is if you look at the priority positions, if you go to back to page four and under preserving local school board authority and flexibility, um, the second bullet, the first part of that second bullet actually does say continuing to reduce the number of mandated assessments. So there's, so that, that, that captures that idea. The program over the last number of years, uh, Ms. Schultz has, has uh, mentioned the uh, kind of the evolution of the program. Uh, what we've been trying to do with the program is we've been trying to eliminate specific data points and specific numbers because those change from year to year. Um, so uh, it, we, we, in terms of what's in the program, the program tends to be the general statement of position. And then when we do our advocacy, when we reach out to legislators, when we write letters, when we respond to bills, um, when we ask for legislation, those types of things, that what, what you're mentioning, the, the disparity between the federal requirement and the state requirement, um, those are, that's the kind of data point that we would use to bolster our argument that yes, indeed, the number of uh, assessments can be reduced. But the, that's the reason why that specific, those specific numbers don't show up in there because midway through the year, the federal government, you know, you've, you've got a new Congress coming in, you've got a new president coming in, they could very well go in and revisit and change the number of assessments. Um, so the, the data point itself doesn't get added, but the concept, and the concept, as I said, is, is reflected uh, not, not only in the program, but also among the priority positions. Well, I, I'm, I'm looking at this, and again, um, which, which page do we think this language is captured on? on page four, which is uh, the actual Fairfax County School Board 2017 priority positions. Yeah, but wh which? Under preserving local school board authority and flexibility, so it's the second header, and then it's the second bullet under that second header. Right, so I would just humbly suggest that, because I understand you're saying it sh could shift, but why wouldn't we at a minimum help our state legislators understand that why aren't we at, at, at least adhering to the, the federal government's requirements versus that we're so far above it? Because I, I, I know what you're saying, but our legislators, when I've talked to them, honestly, some of the, they think this is really pretty language, but it doesn't tell them what to work on. And so I guess I don't feel like this really, when it says continue to reduce, why aren't we wanting to say, not just reduce, but to move toward, you know, the minimum that's required by the federal government and a cost savings and an improvement to education for our students? Because I just, I don't feel like that really, I mean, that, that's sort of a, every year we talk about we want to reduce it, but that becomes kind of old, tired cliche and tells you nothing. I mean, I would rather see us have something that would be a little more, um, specific about the, and providing the context. And it, it, I do think it's compelling when people suddenly realize we get, have so many more standards of learning, you know, SOL tests than we're having to technically do by federal government standards. And, and everybody's always blaming No Child Left Behind and, and, and the effects of No Child Left Behind, and yet, Virginia itself is to blame right now because the federal government has eased back so much and we're still, as a commonwealth, really having a negative effect on children's learning. And I personally, as a parent, have watched um, for you know well over the last decade what it did for instruction for, for my children's educational experience coming through and and the volume of SOLs. So um, I appreciate you being at least helping me see where that was and the rationale for why the language is the way it is. Um, I did come away from the work session feeling that the board had a, a little bit stronger position on this than what I feel is here. Um, and that just means I'm gonna have to do some more work uh, with my colleagues. Um, and, and certainly with you, I'd be happy to be helpful during the legislative session if it means having some of us come down and, and really press hard for this. Um, and I'll just say to my colleagues, we had this conversation, the legislative package is something that 
provides a framework for the General Assembly. But in the end, this is the 12 of us doing our very best to communicate with our state delegates and state senators in saying what specifically we would hope to see come out of the General Assembly um, this next cycle. And, and to me, the SOL reform along with the VRS, um, you know, uh, shifting the, ca the repayment structure as we have in here, um, definitely want to say kudos to you, Mr. Malloy, and the language you used. Uh, it's really important that we look at that, that VRS adjustment because it's going to have a major impact, not just on the Commonwealth, but certainly our, our budget here in Fairfax. Um, but overall, uh, I also want to express my appreciation to Ryan McElveen. Um, I know this is a, a, a major responsibility for you too, and uh, the work you've done here coordinating on the board's behalf is appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lockhart, did you uh, want to make a comment? I just want to clarify, and um, I was uh, I appreciate your comments, Ms. McLaughlin. I was looking on page 13 and at uh, numbers 7, 8, and 9, and um, I believe we, we did speak to um, supporting a balanced state assessment program aligned with federal accountability provisions. So there I, I kind of took that. I know you're looking more for specific numbers. Um, and then as well as the concerns in number eight, the concerns about the frequency of standardized testing and then some supporting of reforms to the assessment system. And there are some specifics there. I hear what you're saying um, in terms of, the, of additional uh, information and a, a, diff, uh, a more defined stance. Um, but I know we, that we did try to address some of those things as well. Mrs. Strauss. Thank you. I will be supporting the package, and uh, thank you for the reorganization of it. I think it makes it much stronger. Um, and I believe Mr. McElveen did mention earlier, but I wanted to say it again, our, our push for uh, the returning to the original schedule for the VRS, it is a $25 million change um, uh, as we have begun our development of the uh, FY 2018 budget and have already had two meetings with the Board of Supervisors. Um, we are looking again at a difficult budget year. So the VR, the change in the VRS is worth a great deal of money, $25 million. That is a lot. So um, uh, the Board of Supervisors are, um, uh, have joined with us in this effort and are trying to reach out to um, other divisions and localities in the Commonwealth of Virginia because this has an impact not just on Fairfax County, but all the schools and all the jurisdictions in Virginia. Thanks. Ms. Palchuk. Yes, thank you. Um, my comments echo a lot of what Ms. Strauss said. I, I will support this. I also, um, I appreciate the work that has gone into it. I think this package is important, but not sufficient. Um, and I do hope um, that we can work with the county staff as well uh, to have a strategy for how we advocate. So I know this is a document, this has really important guidance, you know, for your work as well, um, Mr. Molloy, but I, I do hope that any way that we as a board or as a community can really have a strategy, especially in our tough budget of how to return the VRS to the original schedule. Um, I hope we can, we can have that this year um, to, to support your work. One person's not enough, so thank you. Mrs. Corbett Sanders. Thank you. Um, collaboration, that's really what this legislative package is about. It's a package that um, really has, as uh, Mrs. Schultz just pointed out, 185 bullets in it. And um, that's because of the breadth of activities that our state legislature gets engaged in. And so this is kind of a, a cheater's guide to hey, what does Fairfax County think on specific issues that impact our schools? And um, it, it's it, as a guide, doesn't necessarily go into the level of depth that each of us would like on a particular issue 
um, be it SOLs, be it funding, be it you know a whole range of things. But it is that top level um, discussion of it. And then I just wanted to let people know that the next steps, what they are, we've been working collaboratively with the Board of Supervisors and so you see parallel activity of some of the things in this legislative program in the Board of Supervisors legislative program. And then in the next week, this board will be meeting with our colleagues who actually go down to Richmond as members of the House of Delegates in the Senate to um, work on bills. And so some of the activity or some of the items listed in the legislative package will be picked up as bills by our local um, policymakers that go down to Richmond and others will be, as they see items that come before them, they will know um, that Fairfax County Public Schools cares about an item and will know to either get in contact with Mr. Malloy or one of us to talk about it. But I would also encourage all of my colleagues to um, join Mrs. Schultz on the bus and be willing to go down to Richmond and advocate for these very important issues um, and also to be willing to work with us as we go across the uh, bridge into Washington, D.C. to talk about um, these important issues to the federal government. Thank you, uh, and I will uh, just state very quickly since um, my colleagues have addressed this uh, about the VRS, uh, I, I absolutely agree that we need to work very hard to um, uh, hope that our legislators will go back to the previous schedule. This is a position that was supported recently at VSBA. It was um, supported uh, the school board, the Virginia School Board Association, as well as the Virginia uh, Superintendents Association and the. Um, uh, the Virginia Counties Association as well. So I think we need to work with our colleagues throughout Virginia because um, uh, going to the, uh, the old schedule would help every jurisdiction in Virginia as well as uh, uh, do a, uh, give a little bit of help to the state government as well. So uh, with that, uh, I will call for the vote. The uh, motion is that the board adopt the 2017 state and federal legislative program as amended. All those in favor, raise your hand. Palchuk, Corbett Sanders, Strauss, Evans, Moon, McLaughlin, and McElveen. All those opposed? Schultz, all those uh, abstaining? Huff and Wilson. That motion passes. We go to the consent agenda. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. 5.01, approve the minutes of the November 3rd and November 14th regular school board meetings. 5.02, appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. 5.03, award a contract for the Luther Jackson Middle School roof replacement project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Interstate Corporation in the amount of $850,000 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 5.04, Award a contract for the Robinson Secondary School roof replace, replacement project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, R.D. Bean, Inc., in the amount of $895,330 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 5.05. Award the contract for the automatic temperature control system replacement at Bailey's Elementary School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Siemens uh, Industry Inc. in the amount of $509,150 uh, and authorize the division superintendent and the assistant uh, or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer 
the contract on behalf of the school board. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Now we go to new business and I call on Dr. Lockhart to introduce the mid-year budget review presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased to welcome um, Assistant Superintendent for Financial Services, Kristen Michael, to the podium to his presentation and information regarding the mid-year budget reveal. Ms. Michael. Thank you so much. This is the FY17 mid-year budget review, which includes the final year-end audit adjustments from FY16. After tonight's presentation, we have a work session scheduled for next Monday, December 5th. First, I'll review the school operating fund, and then I'll discuss the other funds. And the school operating fund begins at the top of page one. First, the beginning balance for FY17 is decreasing by 1.3 million, which is primarily due to increases in expenditure of 2.1 million, offset by the final sales tax receipts for FY16, which were 0.7 million higher than we projected. The second item B is state aid. Our state aid projection for FY17 is being decreased by 4.4 million. As you're all very aware, as a result of the state's budget for FY16 being more than 1% below the projection, the state will not be funding the state's share of employee salary increases for FY17. VDOE has notified us that when the governor's budget comes out on December, um, we will see this reduction of $4.4 in our state aid for this current school year. The next item, item C, which we do each year, tuition from Fairfax City will increase by $0.5 million in FY17, and this is based on their final tuition bill for FY16. So each year in the fall, we calculate the final bill for tuition after the fiscal year is ended. Then according to our shared school services agreement, the payment for the prior year is always adjusted in the first quarter of the current year. On the top of page two, we have grant adjustments. Um, these include the revenue impact here, and I'll also mention the expenditure adjustments. And this year our adjustments are for IDEA preschool and Carl Perkins, which is career and technical education. These grants are always received after the budget is adopted in May. And for these revenue adjustments, you'll see a corresponding expenditure adjustment. So as a result of all the revenue adjustments I just went over, our revenue for FY17 will decrease by 5.1 million. Moving to the expenditure adjustments, they begin on the top of page three. So on this agenda, all of these items are shown as non-recurring, but any potential expenditure impact for FY18 will be factored into our proposed budget. Because the amounts will vary slightly from what's included here, they're shown as non-recurring. The first item, item A, is a decrease in expenditures of 1.3 million. As a result of expenditures that were reported after the FY16 final budget review, our encumbered obligations are decreasing. Item B is the corresponding expenditure adjustment for the grant awards that I went over in the revenue section. Item C is an increase in compensation base savings of 6.8 million. Due to higher savings that we experienced from turnover beyond what we projected, base savings are going to increase from 19.1 million to 25.9 million in FY17. Then lastly, I'm very happy to report that item D is a decrease in our health insurance costs of 2.5 million for FY17. Our actual health plan rates for calendar year 17 were lower than projected due to savings we were able to obtain primarily in our pharmacy benefit contract. So that's producing savings for the second half of FY17 which is a very positive note. Finally, on the top of page four, we're recommending setting aside funding to provide early hiring incentives for teachers. As part of the compensation work session on Monday, Dr. Ramey will be presenting information about these incentives. So the combined impact of all of our expenditure adjustments is a savings of 9.9 .9 million. When we move to page five, you can see in the summary that the net impact of our revenue reduction and our expenditure decrease results in funding of 4.8 million being available. It's recommended that this funding be set aside to help us with our FY18 beginning balance. Um, as you know, funding of 22.2 million was set aside as our, at our FY16 final budget review. So adding this additional 4.8 million in funding would bring our total beginning balance funding for FY18 to 27 million. 
This will help reduce our projected gap for FT FY18 by 4.1 million. When we get to page six, you'll see an update in our enrollment for FY17. Official enrollment for general education is as of September 30th, as shown on the chart. The variance between the projected and actual enrollment for general education was 933 students. That's only for general education. You can see that the remaining category of students will be reported when we reach their official enrollment measurement date, and we'll provide updates on those enrollment categories at future quarterly budget reviews. Also of note, as of October 26th, we had 11 positions remaining in our staffing reserve. We'll continue to have staffing meetings through late January, and we'll provide our final update on the staffing reserve as part of our third quarter budget review. So lastly, our other funds begin on page seven. Each of the funds includes the final year end audit adjustments for FY16, and I'm just going to go over the significant variances. In the construction fund, we're recognizing 0.8 million due to expenditure adjustments that were reported after FY16 ended. In addition, we're recognizing funding of 0.1 million from the county for synthetic turf replacement. Finally, in the construction fund, you'll see that our authorized but unissued bonds are increasing by $100 million. This is due to additional projects that we're loading in our financial system from the FY15 bond referendum. The major project there is Herndon High School's renovation. In the grants and self-supporting programs fund, we're recognizing new and revised grant awards that total a net increase of 6.1 million. And a chart showing the detailed grant adjustments is reflected on page eight. Next in our health insurance fund, we have an increase in revenues, which results from our year-end adjustments. This is offset by a decrease in both revenue and expenditures due to those changes in health insurance rates for calendar year 2017. When we look at our health insurance fund, overall our premium stabilization reserve is increasing to 39.9 million, which is still below our target of three months of claims paid. Finally, ERFC includes interest adjustments, which result in an increase in their ending balance of 29.4 million. So we have a work session scheduled for Monday to discuss any questions that the board may have, and I thank you for the opportunity for me to present the FY17 mid-year budget review. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the, uh, that excellent and succinct review of our mid-year budget review. I have several uh, people wanting to ask questions. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Men. Well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just want to remind the board members again that we have another opportunity to talk about this at the work session on Monday. And if uh, and also as a co-manager of the particular work session with. Mr. Koufax, I, I, want, I would like to know if uh, board members are intending to bring any, for the you know, board's consideration, any amendment. I mean, you obviously, we don't have to have an amendment until a couple of days before, I mean, that's not, but if you are thinking about to, you know, proposing amendment, I would love to see us have an opportunity to discuss that at the work session on Monday. With that said, uh, your uh, the staff's recommendation to set aside the 4.8 toward the you know, beginning balance for FY 18s, so that FY beginning balance uh, would become 27 million dollars more or less. Is that how is that compared to the beginning balance that was put into budget for FY 17? I want to see the delta between. Correct. Our beginning balance in FY 17 is 33 million dollars. 33. So after we add this 4.8 million, we'll still have a gap of 6.1 million when we compare the funding we have set aside for FY18 to our FY17 budget. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Strauss. Uh, thank you. At the work session on Monday, I will be asking questions about the fact that there are only 11 positions left in the teaching reserve. Um, I'm concerned about that. Sure. That's uh, very low for the beginning of December. I know that we, well, for special education, we staff 12 months of the year. And for everybody else, we generally will staff until about March. So I will be asking some more questions about that. Thanks. Mr. McAveen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just very briefly, um, I do want to say I'm, I, I never would have thought that uh, we would have seen um, such good news in the health insurance category, uh, particularly this year and, and what's going on nationally. But 
Um, congratulations on that. I think all of us received um, the mailing that um, the C CVS will now be doing our, um, our, our phar pharmacy benefits. Uh, so can you explain what that means just very briefly? Sure. Um, this is through the great work that the Department of Human Resources did. Our previous um, pharmacy benefit manager, our company was Express Scripts. And when we sent that contract out for procurement to rebid it, we were able to negotiate some substantial savings um, that helps the employer costs come down in terms of our health insurance. So it was a really great, um, great effort from our Department of Human Resources. Okay, that's excellent. And congratulations to Dee Holly and, and, and friends. Ms. Uh, I just want to clarify something before we're patting ourselves on the back too much. The um, we, we, the, the savings aren't totally from a negotiation of reduced contract rates. That's also from passing on costs to employees, is it not? So when we look at the savings that we're, we're reflecting here, this really is primarily due to the changes in our pharmacy benefit script. And um, we'd be happy on Monday to provide you with a summary of the things that changed in terms of our plans, but we're still paying the same percentage of the employer cost as compared to previously and had very few plan changes for calendar year 17. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be interested in the discussion of the increased levy from last year to this year for employees. Um, and, and particularly um, for employees where both uh, um, spouses or household members are employees of FCPS. I know that that's a particularly difficult um, position for many. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. The following are new business agenda items. There won't be a vote on these items tonight, but action is scheduled for a future meeting. 6.01, approve revenue and expenditure changes reflected in the FY 2017 mid-year budget review as detailed in the agenda item and on which we just received a presentation. 6.02, award the contract for the chiller replacement at Wapples Mill Elementary School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.03, award a contract for the Waynewood Elementary School renovation and additions project to the lowest and responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Next on the agenda is Superintendent Matters and I call on Dr. Lockhart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I have a few uh, pieces of information to share tonight. First, um, nearly 37,000 FCPS students received school supplies or backpacks as part of the 2016 Collect for Kids campaign. The number of FCPS students served by the program has increased by 128% since, since 2011. Of the more than 50,000 FCPS students who are eligible for free or reduced uh, school meals, 73% of them benefited from this year's campaign. The 2016 campaign served 10% more students from the previous year. However, more than 13,000 FCPS students still need help for the current school year. FCPS staff members work throughout the year on efforts supporting the Collect for Kids campaign to include pyramid resource fairs, backpack collection drives at the Gatehouse and Willow Oaks administrative buildings, and FCPS warehouse space is used to directly support over 9,000 students. Additionally, school-based employees distribute the donated school supplies and backpacks from Collect for Kids partners directly to the students. The foundation for Fairfax County Public Schools directly supports the Collect for Kids campaign by collecting, mon collecting monetary donations from the community to support the resource fairs and to purchase additional supplies for distribution. So it's a big, a big effort. We'd like to thank all of our great volunteers who make this necessary program a success for our students. In other news, we'd like to congratulate Michael Plugraff on being named the 2017 Outstanding Secondary School Assistant Principal of Virginia. Michael is one of the assistant principals at South County High School. We are very proud of Michael, and that's quite an accomplishment. 
Parents, guardians, and their middle and high school children are invited and encouraged to attend together an upcoming Protect Against Substance Abuse program sponsored by the Unified Prevention Coalition of Fairfax County, or UPC. The forum is scheduled for 7 p.m. on Monday, December 5th at Fairfax County Public Schools Gatehouse Administration Center in the First Floor Cafe. The program is part of U UPC's efforts to reach the community with information about the signs and symptoms of teenage drug abuse, what actions parents can take, and where to find supportive resources. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lockhart. Um, next on the agenda is uh, board committee reports, but we uh, have no committee reports because the forum was canceled tonight. Um, next is uh, board matters, and I call on Mr. McElveen. Nothing from me. I uh, hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Mr. Wilson? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'd like to reiterate what uh, Mr. McElveen has said. I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And as you um, wind up the year, I hope everyone has a uh, healthful and happy December. Uh, enjoy your time off at the end of the month. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin? I just want to say that it's um, wonderful to see our interim superintendent, um, Dr. Lockhart, uh, stepping in uh, and joining uh, this merry group of 12. And uh, we look forward to partnering with you uh, in some very, very busy months ahead in all the work that we have. And uh, as we uh, shared with your predecessor, uh, while the passion to do this job can um, consume you, um, we do hope that you know we fully support the fact that work-life balance is important, not just for our students and our teachers and our administrators, um, but most especially for our, our superintendent who's leading um, this great school system. So uh, welcome to you and also to one of my very favorites, um, Mr. Dan Paris. It's also wonderful to see you stepping in as our deputy and uh, I know so many of us are very grateful um, with your institutional knowledge, your expertise, and as you taught me many years ago, the importance of common sense. It's great to have your leadership here with us as well. And, uh, and then just to my colleagues, uh, I, I want you all to know that a passion of mine since I joined the board um, has been about uh, student stress and, and uh, homework loads. And uh, this is something that um, I'm really working on getting some more data to bring to all of you and to bring with our leadership team because I do think that in talking to our students and our families, um, it's become evident that um, we seem to have this cycle of more and more tests and quizzes and assignments and our, our students are simply drowning and um, it's really impacting their passion and joy for learning. And so um, I'll let you enjoy the, the holiday season, but I'll uh, definitely be bringing some things to you on this topic and, and we'll do it through the forum itself. But I wanted to let you know that it's uh, really something I'm just continuing to hear and I, I look forward to some of our intentional work on it. Mr. Moon? I'm going to pass. Mrs. Strauss? Thank you. As now there are many fun activities for families uh, in December as we uh, begin the official holiday season after finishing all of our turkey. On Saturday, we have the Rain Dog Parade in McLean. If you have a puppy dog, you want to bring a little dog food and join the parade. Um, Herndon will have their holiday tree lighting and sing along. And on Sunday, we have the McLean Winterfest Parade and I'll be riding in a car called Buttercup. Should be fun. <laughs> Mrs. Corbett Sanders. Yes, along those lines, um, I want to encourage community members to uh, join in the fun holiday activities that many of our schools are sponsoring, be it um, holiday concerts at the elementary, middle, and high school, or purchasing your greenery for your um, holiday decorations at our local high schools because uh, much of the funds that, go, that uh, are generated 
from those sales actually go back into um, the booster organizations to support our sports and our um, music organizations. I also wanna take the opportunity to um, congratulate this incredible trio of individuals in the West Potomac community that have spearheaded the efforts to get the Wolverine Green Learning uh, cottage or learning community established. And they have uh, broken ground this week on an outdoor learning space, uh, which will be in front of the school. And so thank you very much for the excellent work of Sue Bernstein, Steve Larson, and Rick Gennario for that. And then finally, I would uh, encourage community members to come out to one of my three town halls that I will be having to discuss the um, budget and other um, issues before our school system. My first one will be on December 7th, held at Mount Vernon High School at 7 p.m. Second one will be on January 9th at Saratoga Elementary School and on January 17th at the South County High School. So thank you very much. Yes, so um, I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, Mr. Paris, glad to have you back to help us noodle through some stuff. It's a little inside joke. Um, there was a, a meeting here, and um, I know uh, Ms. Hines isn't here, but there was a meeting in the community on the milestone communications and uh, monopole issue that had concerned so many in the community. And um, I am glad to know that um, decisions were made outside this board um, in uh, other county committees um, that look like that's been put on hold at least uh, temporarily, nothing to do with this board, but um, reporting that out. Um, Holiday-wise, I am looking forward very much uh, this weekend on Saturday to see the Robinson Secondary Singers um, who will be in the town, the historic town of Clifton for the horse parade and the candlelight tour of homes. Um, and that, uh, that information is available on the uh, Clifton, Virginia um, website. Um, I have announced and it has gone out uh, this afternoon that I'm forming a bipartisan uh, budget advisory group um, in the Springfield District. Um, if you have not received um, information on that, you can contact the school board office and um, we have just three very simple questions for you on why you wanna serve. I'm really in particular looking for people who have subject matter expertise, um, either in um, the financial, the accounting fields, um, whether you do it in private industry um, as an individual um, for a company or um, in some kind of government capacity. Um, this is outside of uh, the reconstitution of the superintendent uh, budget advisory committee um, formed of citizens appointed by members of the board and others. Um, this will be to advise me in a very uh, complicated um, budget um, session, but I've been approached by a number of very competent individuals who are looking and willing to serve um, on a voluntary basis, and um, I would uh, very much appreciate um, a group being formed. So if you have interest in that, please let me know. Um, and lastly, uh, it's um, always difficult, um, particularly this time of year, um, but my condolences go to my Spartan community um, at West Springfield High School and the loss of another student. Um, please, we have resources in the form of crisis text, crisis link um, to get families, uh, Families, the resources that you, you may need if you have a student who is struggling or if you know a student who is struggling. Um, if you are a peer student and know somebody who's struggling, tell somebody. Um, it's very, very important. Um, this is, um, pardon me, this is a very difficult time of year um, for families to lose a child. And um, whether it's a faith leader um, in your community that you can turn to um, or somebody, a trusted uh, administrator or teacher in a building, um, or just talking to their parents. And quite often it's a peer of a student that saves um, their friend. And we can't help those who do not reach out for help. 
um, but the resources are there. And I, I pray going into this that um, what Ms. McLaughlin was um, indicating, and, and she and I have been compatriots in, in um, relentlessly seeking um, relief for not only students, but, but the teachers over the coming break do not assign homework that is due the day after or two days after or you know the next uh, class session after these students return. Um, you know the statistics show that having a break actually means that students will perform better and the teachers need the break too. And so um, this this is a time that look, a bad grade is not going to ruin a child's life, um, either as a parent, and believe me, I have four boys, we've had bad grades. Um, they don't change the trajectory of your life, but um, making, making the bad decision um, to do something in a self-harming way does permanently affect not only the student, but the friends and the family they leave behind. So. Um, I ask the administrators to work with your staff in your building um, to set expectations. Certainly, Dr. Lockard um, and uh, his leadership team are gonna support that. And, um, and we as a board know um, the consequences of student stress, mental health and wellness uh, if that is not supported. So, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you to those who came to my office hours yesterday. I really enjoyed the conversation that ranged anywhere from grading policy and student stress, ironically, um, as well as budget and our superintendent search. So I look forward to continuing to hear from the county constituents as we go forward on those topics. Thank you. Ms. Palchik. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna welcome Dr. Lockhart. Good to have you here at the dais. Um, and thank you for all your work. I um, really enjoyed uh, participating in my second advisory council this week at Kilmer Middle School um, with our wonderful officer Alan there who is here supporting us this evening as well. Thank you for all you do. Um, this Friday, Kilmer will have the Ha Ha Holiday um, improv, uh, theater improv competition at 7 p.m. It was one of my favorite activities in middle school, so I'm going to do my best to join them. Um, Luther Jackson last night, this was a packed house. You could not get in for their winter orchestra concert. So I want to congratulate the students, the families, um, and especially their wonderful conductor, Ms. O'Hara Labrie, for everything she does and her passion. Um, as we enter the holidays, uh, some of you may have received the many requests for, uh, for Give Tuesday donations. Um, I want to make sure people know that the foundation for FCPS works very hard to support our schools. Um, and there are many community organizations that are supporting our kids and our families, um, especially during the holiday season. We do have almost one in three of our students in Fairfax County living in poverty. So I hope that as you celebrate with your families, you will also think about um, helping other families in our community celebrate as well. And with that, uh, I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving and happy holidays if we don't see you at our next meeting. And I would like to join my colleagues in welcoming Dr. Lockhart to um, your first official meeting with us as interim superintendent. And uh, you know, so Dr. Lockhart has certainly been a key part of the team for quite some time, but um, thank you for joining us on the, the dais. And uh, Mr. Paris, welcome as our deputy um, interim, interim deputy superintendent. Is that what we're saying now? And um, it's great to have an old friend back. And um, welcome, and uh, we look forward to working with you. I wanted to um, mention the students and the teacher, uh, Ms. Mulcahy, who spoke this mo uh, just uh, earlier this evening about later start times for middle school. Uh, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. And of course, when we got our later start times for high schools, something had to give. We made our middle schools go a little bit earlier for some. It's had um, an, an impact that uh, we hope we can moderate 
in the future. We did say at the time when we adopted the later high school start times that we would continue to work on the middle school times. Uh, we know they're not ideal for our middle school students. They are also adolescents. And so I did just wanna let the, uh, the teacher, Ms. Uh, Mulcahy, and her students and others out there watching that I certainly am dedicated to uh, continuing to look for ways to get those middle school times at a more reasonable time as well. Uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned.